Thank you, Jasper. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'd like to start my uh, talk with an answering the question how to clone the cells when the how to clone the cells when they are basically dense. Uh, it's gonna be yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if I have, yeah, tell me. So basically this is a method we developed. So we are uh, cloning the cells by fooling them into thinking that they are crowded by E cadherin. So if you place the cells in lambda five to one, they don't grow in clones. If you sell, if you plate the cells in lambda five to one and E cadherin taken at the nine to one proportions, in this case, cell thinks that there are neighbors around and cell thinks that uh, basically uh, it, it, it can divide. Maybe it can be one of the solutions for your paper. But first things first, so I'm going to talk about factors that affect safety of human pluripotent stem cells in the medical applications. So first of all, uh, how is the situation right now? We know about four, well, probably there are many, but I know about four uh, studies, clinical trials with uh, enrolled patients. Uh, first, uh, it was spinal cord injury by Jerome. Uh, four to five people enrolled. Uh, they start in 2010. They had a lot of problems in 2011. They quit. No report uh, submitted, but uh, it's known that patients suffered no uh, health complications related to transplant cells, which is very good. Uh, also known that this study is going to be resumed by uh, Asterius, probably. Uh, by Asterius uh, uh, biotherapy, biotherapeutics, and hopefully we will see the reports and here we will see results. So second, also already mentioned here, uh, advanced cell technologies, uh, macular dystrophies, 18 patients, now they actually started the third one. 18 patients, uh, uh, safety and efficacy study, also human embryonic stem cells, uh, no health uh, issues related to the transplant, uh, to the graft detected. Many of the 18th, they actually uh, had uh, improvement in their conditions. So this study is very interesting in Japan in 2014 human uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, a woman in her 70s uh, were treated, uh, it was also some kind of uh, macular degeneration and uh, she was treated with uh, iPS cells generated from her own cells. So basically it is a uh, first example of uh, iPS cells being used in medicine. Not uh, very much known what kind of methods, how many patients they treat right now, I don't know. And my personal favorite is Viasite. They enrolled 40 patients right now. What they do, they actually protect the graft from immune system by a device which can be implanted under skin. And uh, they, uh, it is a treatment of type one diabetes mellitus. So as you can see, there are many clinical studies right now which are uh, basically uh, underway. One uh, may uh, basically uh, point a couple of common features. One common feature is that the studies, they either use uh, immunoprivileged site or they actually create a site which is not, uh, which protects the cells from immune system. The second thing is, at least these guys and these guys, they treated the patient with precursors. 
basically which shows the, uh, uh, how, how, tr how truly believe they are in the differentiation methods which exist right now. Uh, well, uh, why human pluripotent stem cells? Because they're capable of self-renewal, so many, as many cells as you want uh, and can be differentiated into any somatic cell type. Great things, but uh, there are risks of, uh, and safety risks of uh, human pluripotent stem cell use in medicine. Uh, so, before graft is transplanted into patients, so there is a need to culture human pluripotent stem cells in vitro for a long period of time to multiply their number and after that to differentiate them. Uh, therefore, there is a risk of contaminations with viruses and uh, uh, bacteria. Also, uh, Martin in 2005 showed that, showed that uh, cells can acquire immune molecules from media and or from uh, fewer cells and uh, they can become uh, immunogenic. One more important thing is as soon as you use something which is batch to batch variable your life becoming very interesting so you get surprises. Uh, even if there are good surprises in medicine it's very very actually bad thing because standardization of the cellular grafts is the key uh, property uh, of your method to be approved by uh, FDA or any other uh, regulatory uh, body. Also there is tumorigenicity of human pluripotent stem cell, ethical issues of course, regulator regulatory issues and some others. Therefore, it was time and um, uh, very expensive, time consuming and very expensive to receive an approval for the first clinical trial invo involving human embryonic stem cells. Giron actually wasted a lot of money, a lot of time, and in the end, they ran out of money. But uh, already for advanced cell, advanced cell technologies, it was much easier because, as they say, they knew what to expect. So as it is, as it looks right now, there is a critical mass of knowledge for new clinical uh, trials to start and the, to, for the field to blossom actually. Uh, but even a small health issue related to transplanted cells and ongoing clinical trials will jeopardize the future of the field as it was, for example, with uh, gene therapy in the past. So uh, here, Biolamina actually tries to deal uh, with many risks of uh, human pluripotent stem cell use in medicine. For example, risks of culturing environment, uh, contaminations, acquisition of uh, monogenicity, batch to batch variability. So what would be <coughs> an ideal cult cell culture system which would uh, uh, basically uh, facilitate development of clinically uh, of clinical uh, clinical grade human pluripotent stem cell. Well first of all as any other cell culture system it should strongly promote pluripotency and block differentiation. Preferably it should be natural chemically defined environment the system should be pathogen free, xeno free and easy to use, easy to upscale. So our approach, well there are many actually published which are uh, close to this uh, ideal uh, cell culture system. One of them is our system built on uh, uh, alpha 5 laminins, uh, laminin 5 to 1, laminin 5 on 1. And now uh, ideology is to use Biorelevant molecules. What do we call biorelevant? So basically, here you can see a very well known picture. Uh, the gray surface here is the surface of a cell. The cell presents receptors and molecules of extracellular space, extracellular matrix molecules, they interact with the cell. 
So there are many uh, extracellular matrix molecules, collagens, perlicans, uh, uh, agrins, uh, lamanins, and so on. But among those, lamanins are the ones which are always in contact with the cells. What are lamanins? Lamanins are large heterotrimeric glycoproteins. They consist of alpha, beta, gamma chains. There are known five alphas, four betas, three gamma chains today in humans. So uh, more than 16 isoform, isoforms exist. They are major basement membrane components, so they are in contact with the uh, majority of uh, organized uh, cell types in the body. They have tissue-specific distribution. They mediate cell adhesion, migration, proliferation, differentiation, phenotype stabilization. They are shown to actually pro to actively uh, signal into uh, many, many types of cells. So they detected at the earliest developmental stages, actually at the stage of four cells already there are uh, laminin, uh, laminin uh, chain production can be detected. So they are named, named after the chain composition. So lamin 5 to 1 is lamin which consists of lamin alpha 5, beta 2, gamma 1. But why natural? Uh, because they are always in contact with human embryonic stem cells or in the source of, of human uh, or you can find them in the source, natural source of human embryonic stem cells. For example, here you can see that alpha-5 la uh, laminins can be found in between the cells in the inner cell mass of blastocysts, which is the source of human embryonic stem cells. But more of a here is the uh, immunohistochemistry staining of a colony which is grown actually on top of the feeders. So uh, as you can see here, alpha 5 laminin staining is in green. So you can see the staining in between and on top of the cells, even if you culture them on feeders. Also others, and we showed that human pluripotent stem cells, they produce laminin stem cells, and especially they produce alpha-5 laminins, such as al uh, laminins 5, 2, 1, and 5, 1, 1. So basically, even if you're not, if you don't like biolamina, if you're not a customer of biolamina, you're using laminins anyway with your uh, cultures of uh, human pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so we tried, this is, well, published in 2004, uh, we tried uh, if uh, these laminins can harbor human, uh, human pluripotent stem cells and indeed alpha-5 laminins can uh, catch pluripotent stem cells, can make them to survive, you can proliferate pluripotent stem cells on alpha-5 laminins, especially on laminin 5 to 1 in this nice way when uh, you have a nice monolayers of uh, homogeneously pluripotent stem cells. Also the number of multiplication rate is high, but mostly because of lower sort of, you know, losses during the passaging procedure. Cells can be differentiated into free germ, lay, uh, free germ uh, lineages of uh, of a blastocyst. Second thing, system should be uh, xeno-free and chemically defined. So, if before we, we used to use something like this, many bands, something undefined, batch to batch different, uh, with uh, unpredictable results. So, lamin 5 to 1, it is a recombinant protein, very clean preparation, every time is the same, no batch to batch difference, and of course it is a human protein. So this system, it can deal with this uh, <coughs> problems of contamination, because obviously laminins are not fierce, so they can be made in a clean way containing no viruses and uh, bacteria. So 
no acquisition of homogeneity because it's a human protein and it's a stable preparation. One more problem is actually uh, ethical issues which are uh, somehow chasing human pluripotent stem cells since the moment of, uh, since the discovery. Usually when you uh, derive human pluripotent stem cells, you uh, use inner cell mass of a blastocyst and you destruct the blastocyst completely. So uh, we used laminin 5 to 1 and adherin to create a, a basically environment which uh, signals from, which provides signals from extracellular matrix proteins, laminin 5 to 1, and from uh, cells around adherin. And the cells uh, in this way can be fooled into thinking that it has actually neighbors. So in using this method, you can do two things. You can clone human embryonic stem cells without rock inhibitor with high efficiency. And uh, you can uh, derive human embryonic stem cell line without destruction of an embryo. And all the systems can be done in xenofree chemically defined conditions. So this is all nice, of course, but uh, the one thing, tumor genicity of human prepotent stem cells is still standing. And the problem is that uh, uh, it is a capital thing which is inbuilt in nature of human prepotent stem cells. So key facts are the following. So human prepotent stem cells, they form benign teratomas after transplantation into the recipient organism, me form, of course. So this property is used to uh, uh, conform pluripotency of human pluripotent stem cells. So when uh, the cells injected in, into uh, immune deficient mice. And to make the situation worse, prolonged culture of human pluripotent stem cells in vivo, as we heard from Claudia, they, uh, they can lead to uh, genetic abnormalities. So uh, it's been shown that metagenesis is not related to the nature of human pluripotent stem cells themselves because of a high rate of multiplication, because of uncoupling of certain uh, apoptosis checkup points, uh, rather than to culture conditions. But factors that affect frequency of mutations are largely not known. Uh, some of the mutation resembled, re resemble the ones found in cancer cells. So the mutations can be big. For example, here you see karyotyping. And uh, we see a trus trisomy of uh, chromosome 8. Some can be also large but affect chromosome arms, like here, chromosome 20. And most importantly, some of them can be so small that you cannot detect them on uh, using uh, standard karyotyping techniques. For example, this karyotype is normal. It is line HS181. But as soon as you go deeper and use a method with higher resolution, you see that BCL2 locus. Uh, aberration. So it would be very interesting and important to study factors that they may affect mutagenesis. But uh, the problem with that was all the time, well, there were actually three problems. First problem was relevant controls. So as soon as you take one parameter out, all others should be fixed. And for example, if you want to compare rate of mutagenesis uh, in cells cultured on fears and alumni in 5 to 1. So first thing you'll see that it's going to be different media. Second, it's going to be different uh, passaging technique. Third, it's going to be uh, different pH stresses and so on, so on, so on. And in the end, you don't know what actually, what is there. So uh, relevant controls is an important thing here. Uh, 
Second problem is there are just too many parameters. So for example, it was one urban, so to speak, legend that enzymatic digestions, digestion of human pluripotent stem cells lead to higher rate of mutagenesis in them. Also, cell culture medium can affect the cells. Coating can assault the, sex, uh, the uh, cells. Uh, density uh, of plating can, can, af can affect the cells. Uh, uh, temperature regime, pH regime, uh, as well as, for example, uh, rock, as we discussed before. Too many parameters. So second, uh, third thing is how, how long the experiment should be. So like we heard from Claudia, it was comparison the passage number 100 with passage number 200. And uh, well, if we want to have, for example, statistical power, if we want to have all the parameters taken, and we want to have 100 passages, it's going to be unrealistic to do any actually experiments. The third question is actually the easiest to answer. So we have this growth curve, so we can calculate how many cells we are going to get in how many passages from, how we, uh, from one uh, standard aliquot. So as it's easy to calculate here, if you for one standard aliquot of cells, uh, it usually gives you some 100,000 uh, uh, living cells, and uh, culture them 10 passages, you get uh, the precise number would be uh, 500 kilograms of human pluripotent stem cells. So uh, it is not needed really to culture uh, the pluripotent stem cells more than say 12, 15 passages for medical purposes. Of course for scientific purposes it's a different story. But medical purposes really as soon as you measure your stem cells on tons, it is enough. So 12 to 15 passages, and uh, we devised this method. We used seven different stem cell lines, four human embryonic stem cell lines, three iPS lines. It, <coughs> we had actually four experiments. First experiment, we used Lamin 5 to 1 coating. We uh, checked the enzymatic, non enzymatic passaging. We checked passaging in clumps and single cell suspensions. Second experiment, we compared different coatings. We used Lamin 5 to 1, Matrigel, Vitronectin, well, also rock and, or rock and hip -tour. Third experiment, what we did, we uh, compared the effects of pH stresses, acidic, basic, and temperature stresses. So with this experiment, we just every day, we starting from day two, we treated the, uh, we added base or acid for one hour, making the difference in pH 0 0.3, which is basically what you get in your uh, stem cell cultures from very low passage to, to very high, uh, from very low density to very high density. And uh, uh, experiment number four, we checked normoxia versus hypoxia. Uh, the experiments were done in the following way. So we just physically had 96 wells, well played with uh, different wells, which were side by side. We took the same medium, sa same batch of media. All the cells were treated. They had the same uh, pH stresses. They had the same temperature stresses. They had everything the same. Even the, even the uh, pipette was, uh, it was a multi-pipette thing. And the cells, we tried to keep all the as many parameters as we could. So first thing what we found out is actually passaging in cell suspensions is more robust than passaging in uh, clumps. So passaging in clumps is good. Sometimes you get this nine, nice uh, pictures. Actually, you quite 
quite often it's rare then you get differentiation but sometimes you get differentiation and uh, uh, manual basically uh, you need uh, with uh, passaging in cellular clumps uh, one needs control and every time you see differentiated area you need to come in physically with a knife or with a pipette and physically take it out so it's labor intensive and most importantly again your life is full of surprises you it's hard to prove to the uh, agencies that uh, your cellular preparations are standardized same thing showed in fax analysis so here sometimes you do not see homogeneous populations more than 90 percent of cells uh, octor positive for pathogen in cell suspensions of course uh, density is now one parameter so what we did we calculated the cells so the multiplication sort of you know number of doublings in cultures passaged in clumps it was a little bit lower but on the same sort to speak level uh, we haven't uh, done all the analysis yet so uh, right now I can show you this thing so here we just calculated CNVs so we used uh, whole genome uh, SNP microarrays after that uh, we uh, basically uh, determined uh, copy number variations and uh, loss of heterozygous sites is not shown here so and we see here that basically and also with other four lines that there is no much of a difference between this situation when you use vitron acting cell clumps no enzyme and this situation when you use laminin 5 to 1 single cell suspension uh, enzyme harsh treatment uh, with respect to number of well, bulk number of CNV mutations, we don't see the difference. Of course, our method is not as sensitive and uh, we can detect only cellular populations which are, uh, say, more than one third of a uh, whole. Meaning that we don't know if there are actually rare mutations and we don't know if what kind of what, what, was, what is the frequency, if there is a difference in frequency of rare mutations in this and this case. So this is it. Uh, the work is done here at MVB uh, under the lead of Professor Carl Trigerson. We have our uh, lab technician, Anthony Nielsen, who, who are working with us. We have uh, Professor Oti Kawata, our uh, Main collaborator, Lislet Antonson, Professor Yuha Kiri, who is doing actually RNA sequencing for us because we want to somehow to correlate the data from CNV with RNA sequencing. And uh, again, Carl on the Duke NUS side, and Suju Egoash is helping us with uh, uh, RE analysis. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you.